the room was full to capacity, beyond capacity. And uh, I have to turn some of the students away, use the excuse that uh, they came late. Yes. This afternoon session is senior members uh, and junior members. A student, you're also members of the university community, but you are junior members. Though you are graduate students, maybe you are senior junior members. <laughs> okay, so uh, this afternoon is particularly um, organized for graduate students in the Faculty of Technical and Vocational and Technical Education, FTE, as well as the staff. We, as uh, university, has a mandate to establish linkage with industry and also train our students to fit the industrial needs so that when graduates, they will go out as people who already know what the industry expect of them. In this direction, we have teamed up with the Institution of Engineering and Technology to work hand in hand in training of our students. I'm also a member of the Institution of uh, Engineering and Technology. I'm not just a member, I'm also a member of the Engineering Council of Ghana. We have established uh, that's uh, under the Ministry of Waste and Housing, the Engineering Council that regulates all the engineering activities in Ghana. And under the Engineering Council, we have two professional bodies that are accredited to turn out or to produce or certify uh, uh, registered engineers in the country. And these institutions are Ghana Institution of Engineering, an institution of engineering and technology. We are working with institution of engineering and technology currently. We have a number of activities that we will roll out. We are engaging in having seminars, workshops, uh, conferences, and others. And we are very sure that before our product completes their program, of various programs or graduates, they will have fair understanding as to what goes into the engineering practices in Ghana. Staff are required to also have that deeper understanding. We're supposed to know this and be able to communicate them to our students in the lecture halls. It is therefore important to work together to achieve this. This afternoon, we're going to have some presentations, discussion. Then after, I will give opportunity to those who want to become members of IET uh, to have the way and how to go about it. We have some number of forms here that we think we can share with you. On the high table, I would like to introduce the team or those with us here. On my extreme right, starting from Amsterdam, we have uh, engineer Dr. Sherry, who is the HOD, or head of the department for mechanical and automotive engineering technology. Doug, you are welcome. He's also a member of IET. That's why he has the, uh, the title uh, engineer. Uh, the next is Dr. Albert Aupuni, the head of the department for electrical and electronic engineering technology department. Uh, and myself, as also the Amstead, I'm torn between Amstead and uh, IET, same as other, or a lot of colleagues also here. Uh, I'm engineer professor Humphrey Danso. I'm the head of the department for construction and wood department and also doubling as the acting dean for the faculty of technical education. Go on to introduce the IET members we have here. 
The first after Dr. Aupune is Engineer Davo Wanda. Engineer, welcome. Engineer Wanda is, uh, he is the chairman for the Borden Civil and Construction Division of the IET. Within the IET, we have sectors for different engineering uh, professions. So for Borden Construction Civil, he is uh, the chairman. He also doubled as a member of uh, publicity and uh, affairs, uh, member of the Engineering Council. Uh, yes, for uh, Institute of Foreign Affairs, yes. Uh, I'm also a member in the council and we work together over there. So we work together as much as possible. So engineer, uh, Wanda, welcome. And next to engineer, immediately on my left is engineer Alexander Kalo. Engineer Kalo is uh, in the IET, we have two sectors in Ghana. We have the Southern sector and the Northern sector. The Northern sector is where we find ourselves. And within the Northern sector uh, of the IET, he is the chair, chairman of the whole uh, fraternity of the uh, Institution of Engineering and Technology. So, Engineer Keller, uh, welcome. Then we have Engineer Clement Zai. He is the, before I go to Engineer Clement Zai, let me also introduce Engineer, Cle uh, sorry, uh, Engineer Goffred Doku. Yes. Engineer Goffred Doku is the vice chair for the Northern Sector. So, He's uh, the chairman, then the vice chair for the Northern Center. Then we have engineer Clement Zay, or Zay. He is the secretary to the Northern Center. So engineer, welcome. Thank you. Then we have other members also with us. We have the uh, engineer Richard uh, Bosco Mensa, engineer. So welcome. He's also with the Northern Center. And we have engineer Francis. Amoa, yes, Engineer Francis, also welcome. Uh, he's also with the Northern Center. And they are all at sensitive positions in engineering firms within the Northern Center. And uh, today, we are going to share with you, or we're going to discuss some of the practices within the engineering profession. Uh, I wouldn't like to waste my time as you are aware, especially the student, you know that you also have some three days program, which is ending today, uh, which you can join online. So uh, we'll try and finish as early as possible so that you can join that uh, graduate school program as well. So we'll start with the first presentation, which will be given by engineer Alexander Kello. So engineer, you are welcome. Thank you very much, Prof. Good afternoon to you all. Uh, I think this is the first of its kind, this program is being organized. And this is being organized because of the collaboration we have between IET Ghana and that of the institution Amsterdam University. Uh, this afternoon, we'll not waste much of our time. And we are going to go straight on the topic for the day for us to know where we belong to. So we move on straight to the board. We'll give you the topic, the practice of engineering after graduation, the legal environment. That is what we are going to eat on it. No, this is professionalism. No, they don't know the other. Yes. That is it. Thank you. So the topic is practice of engineering after graduation, the legal environment. Why do we say that? We say this because 
Within where we find ourselves, there are laws, rules, and regulations that govern us. You cannot find yourself in a setting that there will not be rules and regulations, and you'll be happy to live in such environment. So this topic, Engineer Alexander Kello, the chairman of IET, Northern Sector, and at the same time, head of West Department, Ahafano Southwest District Assembly, as the district engineer. Let's move on to the next slide. This one, we have, we have one. So we have engineering practice in Ghana. The engineering practice in Ghana is governed by Engineering Council Act which is 2011, Act 819. The Engineering Council Act 2011, Act 819, establishes Engineering Council of Ghana with a governing board and executive secretary. So you can see that this is the environment that we find ourselves. There has been a council that regulates the body. And with this, there is a need for you to belong to some of these bodies. So the council has so far registered two engineering bodies to practice engineering in this country. And these two engineering bodies are Institution of Engineering and Technology Ghana, that is IET Ghana, then Ghana Institute of Engineering, Ghana Institute of Engineering, which is GHIE. These are the only two bodies that is being mandated to practice within the country to group up people to practice the engineering within Ghana. So in this content, why is it so? we we'll got to know. Let's move to the next slide. Regulating engineering practice. Thus, every profession has rules and regulations, as I said. Every profession has rules and regulations governing its practice. Engineering practice in Ghana is governed by Engineering Council Regulation 2020. This was being, this was uh, uh, 2020, this was established in 2020, the legislative instrument, which is 2020, 2024-10, that established this regulation. The Engineering Council Act provides that a person is qualified to practice engineering if that person is registered under any of the following section, that's section 16 of the Act, 18189. So anybody, any member, any profession has to be registered before you'll be able to practice. So if you're a person, you need to be registered under one of these, I mean, membership. Being a professional engineer, which is PE, being a professional engineering technologist, PET, being a professional technician, PTEC, being a professional craftsman, PCraft. These are the acronyms that is being given to that. And then how to register and practice as engineering. An individual cannot directly register with the council and practice engineering. Why so? The council states categorically that you, a member or any single individual cannot just complete a school and take up the certificate, go to engineering council and say that I have completed my uh, uh, engineering, I mean, course with first class, second class, or whatsoever, I have come to register with you. No, that is not done. You have to belong to one of these bodies that is being registered under the council, which is IET or GHI. So in this call, why so? Because this is in the form of a tree. The council that does not register people individually because there has to be a regulation, a, a body that will be regulating its members and also report to the council. And in this aspect, the IET is one of these bodies that needs to be, that you need to be part before 
the council accept you as a member. And henceforth, it is only the council that will be certifying the engineering members through the bodies. And how does it go? One will have to register with the body. Then upon passing and becoming a member of the body, you'll be able to be part of the certified engineers within the country. So the only two professional bodies, as I said earlier, is IET and DHI. And then what we look at, uh, the second point, which is every practitioner has to register. This is in the form of a tree. When we say a tree, how does it look like? What constitutes a tree? The stem alone does not form a tree. It comes with branches and leaves and sometimes bears fruits to become a, a tree. So if you want to be the stem, the stem is the engineering body that carries all these branches and leaves to be able to register with the engineering council. Let's move on to the next slide. And this is the registration structure with the engineering council. This is the organogram. The organogram with IET, we have under IDT professional engineer, professional engineering technologies. We have professional, prof, we have the P-Tech, we have the professional craftsmen. And when we move to the other side, IET, GHIE, we also have same thing, PE, uh, professional engineering technology, uh, P-Tech, and then professional craftsmen you could see that the council has been able to regulate it in such a way that we are of the same category. There is no difference between the one who is under the GHIE and then the one which is under IET Ghana. We are at par. We all come out with the same qualifications and all that. Let's move to the next slide. A person cannot practice engineering unless he or she is registered. Subject to this act, a person shall not approve, accept to approve or certify any engineering works unless that person is registered under this act, section 30 of the act 819. So this is stated categorically within the law. So if you complete school, and you are not part of any of this body to certify you as a professional engineer, you have no right to certify any designs or prepare anything to be accepted. One needs to be satisfied. As like the doctors, when they even complete and whatever, before you become a doctor, you have to write a professional exam. And then like the accountants and all that, this is a means of which the engineering fraternity also accept members, and then the title engineer is being issued to you as a member. So a registered engineering practitioner may create, design, manufacture, prepare, drawing and document, construct, fabricate, install, maintain, and undertake any other engineering activity within the field of specialization for which they have been registered. So if you are registered under engineering profession, the area that you have been registered to, all these aspects are there for you to do. And when you finish them, the face of it has to be, uh, I mean, endorsed with your stamp and your number to indicate the authenticity of the, of the work that you have done and also identify the person who created that or made that particular, I mean, design. Let's move on. Want to register. One can register as a student member. And then after school, graduation, as a professional engineer, as I stated earlier, as a professional engineering technologist, as a professional technician, as a professional craftsman. And then in a company, you can be registered as, as engineering firm. And then in education unit, you can be registered as, as engineering education. 
So these are the areas that one can be registered under. Let's move on. Why do I have to register as an engineer? Why do I have to register? I have completed my education with my certificates, but you say I shouldn't call myself engineer. Why? Then what is the value of the work that I did during school? Let's continue. In Ghana, move back. In Ghana, nobody or institution is legally permitted to practice engineering without being registered. That is the laws that we have. Nobody is allowed to practice without being registered as a member. The purpose of registration is to regulate engineering practice in order to eliminate or, or reduce unprofessional practice in the country. You see, there are a lot of things that happened just a few years back. All that we, we used to hear in the news on TV is collapse of buildings, collapse of buildings. The recent one, the better be one that killed almost 20 people. Our institution did the research on that and came out with a report at which my brother here was the secretary to that committee. He will talk much about that. So these bottlenecks that we have within the engineering fraternity, that brings about some of these problems within our environment. So how do we deal with it? In order for us to deal with it, is to come out with such measures so that we'll be able to remove the quack practitioners out of the system to prevent the development that causes a lot of havoc within our setting. The most easiest and convenient way to register with the Engineering Council is through IET. Why am I saying that? These are some of the things. We come close to you and explain to you why you must be a member. And when you become a member, all the benefits that is, be, that is needed will be loaded on you for you to also practice and have the feel of the fraternity. So we urge members to make sure that they register with us to become full members for us to develop this nation as required. The best practice is to register before graduation and to begin to practice immediately after school. We had our first session with the students and we introduced them to how they become students membership. To become a student membership, you have the opportunity to go through seminars, trainings and workshops. So after school, you, you will be enrolled into the fraternity without going through any stress because you're already a member. So we don't waste your time for you to go through a lot of things before you become a member. So being student membership, the benefit, one of the benefits that comes out of it is that after school, just after school, maybe during your national service, you can become a member of the institution, a full member, a full graduate member. That's uh, the best practice is to register before graduation and to begin to practice immediately after school. When you don't register before after school, it doesn't mean that you cannot be a member. You still have the opportunity to go through the necessary processes to become a full member of the Institution of Engineering and Technology Ghana. Thank you very much for this short presentation. Thank you, um, Engineer Alexander Kelo. I think I'm right. Um, I will now invite Engineer Don Kowanda to present the next presentation. Thank you, Doc. Um, yes. Uh, Good afternoon once again. I I happen to have worked in a committee with Prof. Hansfred, 
The first time we met was when we were being inducted into Engineering Council Committee. Um, my, we have, like Engineer Kello said, we have Institution of Engineering, Ghana Institution of Engineering, and Institution of Engineering and Technology, IET for short. We are coming from IET. The two of us, we are under Engineering Council. Just like the way doctors, after you finish with your education and you now come out, you will now be allowed to be regulated by uh, medical council. You will be examined and then you'll be given lances to practice. If you don't have lances to practice and you practice, you practice illegally. You can have the needed education. You can have whatever knowledge you have from the education, from, from school. But once you want to practice, you must have lances in order to enable you practice. It is the same that is applicable to the engineering field. When you finish your education, you have the knowledge. You have the knowledge to do whatever you want to do. But then in order for you to be certified and a professional practitioner, you must register with an institution, a body and the engineering council, so that the engineering council will give you license to practice. In fact, all bodies, institution of engineering and then the engineer, Ghana Institution of Engineers, they all practice under the general council. So once you apply through one of them, you'll be given license to practice. This afternoon, my presentation is going to be very short. And um, I am going to talk about whether I need a development authority to enable me to put up my house or a civil engineering structure on a plot of land or my plot of land. We know that in this world, there are three things that we basically talk about, where to put up your head, where to eat, and where to clothe yourself. Where to put up your head is what we're talking about, building. You either build for yourself, you either build for commercial purposes, or you build a factory. If you want to establish a factory to produce something, you put up something. All these are buildings. So the question is, if I have my plot of land, the chief has given me permission to put up a building on my land, why do I have to go to a development authorities again to, to, before I can start putting up my building? Is there the need to go? So this afternoon, we'll look at the pros and cons of putting up these structures on my piece of land. Either the land is given to you by your predecessor or maybe your mother, your father, you succeeded, or you bought it, or whatever. Once you have ownership of the land, you can have development structure on it. But do I need development authority before I do that? So let's go to the next slide. I am Njina Davawanda. I am the chairman of the Civil Land Building Construction Division of IET. We have sectors northern and then southern. But the divisions are, we have electrical, uh, automobile division, we have construction building and all that. We are in building construction and civil engineering division of IET. I'm the chair. Apart from that, I am a practitioner and that for that matter, I am practicing as the head of works for Denchambo. I don't know how many of you know Denchambo. Have you heard of Denchambo before? Denchambo, okay. Denchambo. Uh, yes, Diamond. Diamond. Diamond District. So the capital is Akwetia. When you hear of Akwetia, you know that, yes, we are talking about Diamond. That is why I practice as engineer. I'm the head of the waste department. Uh, for that matter, when you are the head of the waste department, it means that you have several engineers working under you. You have engineers in charge of design engineers in, in charge of structures and all that, engineers in charge of cost engineering and all that. Before you head them, you must be an engineer. 
a certified engineer. Certified. Certified means that you have been licensed to practice by the engineering body. So uh, I am the head of works over there. Um, so why the need to put up a building? When we finish this presentation, I should be able to take us through the need to put up a building, the legal requirements, merits and demerits of seeing the authorities before putting up my structure, and then we conclude. So let's go to the next slide. Yes, yeah, so the need to build, I think I talked about that already. So we all need to put up a building. So there is either I need to put up residential, commercial, or industrial building. Then the development authorities. We have several development authorities. We have Savannah Development Authority. We have Middle Belt Development Authority. We have Coastal Development Authority. There was one time that we even had MIDA, Millennial Development Authority. Yes, they are all development authorities. But the one that I'm coming to talk about is districts, metropolitan, and municipal assemblies. They, the whole country is divided into districts. District, when I talk about districts, I mean districts, metropolitan, and municipal. So when I mention districts, I I mean, any of them or all of them. So the one that I'm coming to talk about, it's about the districts that are mandated to ensure a homogeneous development of every district. And for that matter, development, proper development control. The, the development authorities, the MMDs, they have been able to plan every district, okay, into zones. Like, for instance, when you come to Kumasi, there are some areas that are meant for industries. When you go there, you only see industrial structures. There are some areas that are meant for commercial purposes. You will go there, you see people trading, marketplaces and all that. And there are places that people sleep. Where we sleep or where we put up our heads, we call it residential zone. And where we, we trade or we undertake commercial activities, we call it commercial buildings or commercial zone. Then when we talk about where we manufacture things, that area becomes industrial zones. So every assembly in every district, they are all planned. Those areas that are not planned, with time, they plan it. They plan it and they develop it for people to put up their buildings. So the development authorities, MMDAs, Metropolitan Municipal District Assemblies, they are in charge of development control. That means that whether we like it or not, once they are in charge of development control, if I want to put up a structure, if I want to develop my land, I need to see them. So when you look at the zones, the section, 20, section 30 of land use and special planning regulation, LI 2384, provides that every district, municipal district assembly, they are supposed to be in charge of every district to ensure that development, it's orderly, it's in accordance with the zones, in accordance with the way they are planned. So if you look at the right-hand side, side you can see some areas, red, yellow, green, and they are the zones. If you are going to put up a house, for instance, residential building, in an area that is earmarked for industrial purpose, it will not be approved. And even if it is, if, if you go ahead and put it up or construct it, they have every right to demolish it. In order not to, uh, in order to avoid some of these things, you see them, they, they tell you, that, okay, this area, it is Yama for Kumasi Industrial Zone. So you can't put up a house and sleep in it. Okay, so that will help. Let's go to the next slide. Yes, yeah, so uh, what, let's look at the legal requirements or the legal environment, government putting up a house. A person shall obtain a building permit from a district planning authority before undertaking the construction of a building or other structure on 
or undertaking any other work on your land. Meaning that before you carry out any work on your piece of land, whether the land belongs to you or not, before you carry out any construction, the law requires that you must be given permits. The permit here is the document that the development authorities, the assemblies give you when you tell them that I want to construct my building. They will give you official document, and that document is what you have to protect your building. Nobody will come and tell you that this building is not for you, or you did not build this building. Once you have it there, you can show them that, yes, I've been given permission, even by the development authority. So when you look at section 106 of the Local Governance Act, uh, Act 936, it talks about that. And when there is another law, we call it Legislative Instrument LI-1630, National Building Regulation. We call it National Building Regulation. It is here. These documents provide that, in fact, when you look at section 10, subsection 2, it provides that no construction work shall be covered until it has been inspected and approved by the district development authority. So even if you are putting up your own house, it is your own land, you are developing it, you must obtain that permission. It must be, each and every stage must be inspected, certified before you can continue. If it is not inspected and certified and you cover it, somebody can take you to court and you'll be in trouble. Let's go to the next slide. So now let's look at advantages and disadvantages of seeing the development authorities. Let me start from the disadvantages, the merits of involving the development authorities. Now, we all know that when you want to obtain permits or when you want the development authority to give you permission to put up your house, they will demand some fee, some amount of money, which we call permit fee. And so, of course, once I'm going to pay money, I will not be happy. So it's one of the disadvantages. Delays in executing projects. When you submit permits, it passes through a whole lot of processes. First of all, there is a team called technical subcommittee. That technical subcommittee will look at your drawing or the kind of building you want to put up. If it is a storage building, we'll look at the beams. You know that in human, every human being, we have bones in us. The flesh is actually being supported on the bones. It's just like the, that is how buildings also work. We have the columns that are serving as the bones. Columns, beams, they are transmitting the load that are on the building to the subsoil. So when you bring this document, this drawing to the assemblies, we will now check this, whether the load on the building can safely be transmitted through the columns and beams to the foundation, to the subsoil. And so when you send these documents there, it's like a second eye to check what you have done. If there is a problem, then they will advise you appropriately. Once it is going through this, some teams will also come to your site to see. Sometimes the way you design your building, when you go to the site, it cannot fit there. You have the plot of land given you is 100 by 90. But the design, when you finish, you finish it all, is going to be 100 by 100. And so it cannot fit there. So they will verify from the site. All these take some time. And therefore, we will delay you. Whilst you are waiting for these processes to go through, it, you'll be delayed. And so it's one of the disadvantages. And then they may demand that uh, projects be redesigned. I talked about that already. If I check about the building, I realize that the foundation that you've designed for this building will not be sustained. Then I will ask that I redesign the foundation before we give you approval. All these will involve, will be, will, will be part of the delay. Then restricted to standards. You know, previously, you can design a building such that you have a walkway and then a corridor into your bedroom. The current national building regulation requires that every corridor must be of a minimum of three feet or one meter, minimum. 
it can go beyond that. But recently, we have a new law in parliament. I met the select committee, legislative select committee on, uh, on this border regulation. This one will be soon repealed. When that one matures, I think it's even laid in parliament, it will take about 21 working days. Once that is done, it means this one will go. The one that we have worked on will now come into being. And what that one is saying is that now we have come of age. Previously, three, meet, three feet or one meter is okay for us. But we are thinking that Ghanaian are becoming big. Maybe, <laughs> maybe because of what we have been eating. So the three meters or three feet or the one meter may not be enough for my, my mom and then my brother to bypass each other easily. And so therefore, instead of the three feet or one meter, let us make it four feet. Very soon, when that one comes, it becomes a law. So when you bring your plan to me for me to certify for you, I will check whether those ones or those standards are met. Otherwise, I will ask you to redesign. So whilst you are being restricted, make sure that this one meets this, the mixture of one, of a concrete mixture, one is to two is to four and all that for reinforcement, and one is to three is to six for mass concrete and all that they are complied with. They are like, I'm worrying you, okay? Even though they are to help you, if I'm going to put up my burden, I don't need development, I can do anything, you know? So those are some of the disadvantages. Let's go to the next slide. Let's look at the advantages now. Now, when you involve a development authority, okay, assuming I put up a very nice house, and then, in fact, there is a law, uh, land use and special planning regulation, section 39, provides that all the assemblies, they should revise their schemes every four years. So it could happen that Kumasi, the industrial zone, the area that they see a for industrial zone, the people have developed so much so that even the factories cannot work. So let us change. People are pleading, pleading that, why don't we change that place to a residential area? And then we move them to another place. The assembly, they have right to do that after four years. So after four years, some big man will come from uh, overseas with huge money would like to put up story buildings and make it rather a commercial uh, site. So that somebody have right to do that. But the law is saying that once you are able to obtain permits from the assembly, when I am revising the area and I need to demolish your building, I need to properly compensate you. So if you don't have a permit, the law is saying that once you don't have permit, even demolishing it, the bulldozer that I'm going to use to demolish it, you should pay me for the bulldozer that I use, the fuel that I use, the operator that has uh, operated the machine to demolish it for you. And I should apply for court cost from you. So all these, if you comply with this, it means that the assembly will have to compensate you. Then to the demolition, We'll go there. There is a session. You see the people demolishing the building. Easy. Once you have obtained permits and they are doing the work, the assembly doesn't have that authority to demolish your building. So to avoid demolition, you obtain or you see the development authority so that you're giving permission. Now, when you are giving permits, it is normally in the form of a document called permit document. And that document can be used as collateral for loans. And it can also be used to bail people when uh, somebody is giving bail in a court or maybe at the police station and you are supposed to bring a property as a shorty and that kind of thing. You can go and show them the burden, it is a burden. But once you don't have that document, it means that the burden can belong to, it can be for somebody else. But once you have the document, that document bears your name. It means you are given permission to do that. The next slide, please. Yes, so um, normally when you put up a building, we have designs. Like I said, each and every assembly has a scheme. In the scheme, we have roads. The roads have what we call uh, buffer zones. Every 
road is divided into two. Whether highway, whether urban road, whether feeder road, whatever kind of road you have, whether first class, second class, third class, they all have two divisions. The first one is carriageway. The second one is reservation. The carriageway for third or surface roads, they are the one we call the tar road, the one that is surfaced, the bituminous surfaced or asphaltic surface or gravel surfaced. That is the carriageway. Beyond that, it's a reservation. It's also part of the road. So that portion reservations are normally reserved for services. When we have electricity cable, that is where we pass it. When we have uh, water, that is where we pass it. And all those places, they are part of the road. Now, after that, when you have a building close to the road or sharing a common boundary with the road, you are supposed to live a distance from that road to your place before you start putting up your building. For every road, the distance is not the same. For each and every road, we, some are having about 10 feet, some 15 feet, some 20, some even 100, depending on the layout of the area. So if I'm coming to put up a building, and then the building is brought a bit closer to the road, say five feet, it means that it has gone beyond the level where it's supposed to be. The, Imaginary line that is passing along the road for which you cannot build beyond is called border line. So as you can see in the drawing there, at the right hand side, we have dotted line. And that dotted line, you can go, you can shift the border beyond it, or you cannot bring it, uh, you know, before the line. Once that is done, it means that you are within the regulation. So in order that you will be sure that for this route, I am within the building line, you obtain permission from there. If the assemblies or the development authorities give you permission, and even before they look, they give you permission, they look at all this. Once you obtain permit, it means that you are within. And then, so every plot of land, when you are putting up a building on it, you are not supposed to build directly on the boundary. You are supposed to have a distance from the boundary, which we call setback. There is difference between the border line and then the setback. And the setback, once you are given permission, it means that you have been given permission for the setback, and for that matter, you are doing the right, the right thing. We have conformity to the scheme. When you go to Accra, all right, when you go to airport, you are not supposed to put up story buildings beyond certain stories. Why? Who can tell me the reason? Yes. Because, yes, because of the flights. Meaning that aer aeroplanes will be landing. And when you get to that level, they normally come down before they land. And when you have a story building, you obstruct the place, okay? So in certain zones, there are limits on the number of stories you can put up. And once that is done and you are given permission, it means that you are within that conform, you, you've conformed to that requirement or you are within that uh, requirement. Conformity with section 10, I talked about it already, that every building before you start, it must be inspected, and then when you finish the foundation, it must be inspected when you get to level, little level, or whatever. If you root, when you're constructing the, 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 the route to your private premises, each and every stage must be inspected. So once it is done, it means that the authorities have given you permission. I talked about it that if the authorities are not able to inspect your property, those stages, you don't have right to even cover them. Let's go to the next slide. Yes. The, when you go to the assemblies or the development authorities give you permission, it means that they have checked 
all that structural stabilities and all that. Uh, you can see that picture at the right hand side. What is it? Who can tell me what is it? Uh, it's what? Very good. Collapse burden or collapse concrete member. When you look at it as a whole, it's a collapse building. But the, the, the one that is in front of us, directly in front of us, is a collapse, collapse concrete member. This picture was taken at Batebi. Batebi, have you heard about Batebi before? Batebi church building that has collapsed some time ago. A church, I think four story building that collapsed without no external force, killing 20 people. One person got missing as of today. So why? If you look at it, this very picture, uh, it is the column, one of the columns that is supporting the building. You can see the small thing that is protruding is the iron rod. The iron rod is supposed to have a containment that is resting on a mat. But this particular column, there is no mat. But the iron rod itself, it's being buried on the ground itself. And then they have this concrete part around the, the base, very small. And then when going up, they change it into square column. And then at a point, they rounded it up. It became very big. I, the, there was a report on this Batebi Church Collapse Building. And uh, the current president of IET was the leader of the team to investigate the cause of the collapse. In fact, we just want to know what happened and what lessons we can learn from that so that in the future we will not commit those mistakes again. And it came out that when we investigated, I was the secretary to that committee. It, we, we realized that we have soil. The soil is divided into layers. Where we place foundation to receive the weight on the building, what we call the, 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 the load. It's at a place 1.5 meters from the ground level. The one that can sustain the building, the strong subsoil, that, can, that has a very good bearing capacity to sustain that building. It is located at a point 1.5 meters from the ground level. But this particular building, they put the, the column just about one foot, one foot, right? About 300 millimeters. Yes, even from here to down is too long. This one is too long. Well, just one foot from the ground level. So we engage them. What happened? Because you can see it yourself that if you are putting up a huge structure of that type, why do you have a small part instead of constructing a whole foundation, a design foundation? They told us that, you see, the church, they don't have money. So they depend on the benevolence of the church members to put up the structure. And that the artisans in the church, they were engaged to do the work. Even though they obtained permit from the uh, uh, Oda Municipal Assembly to put up a single story, like a shed, so that they do the church services in it. When they started, the members, all the artisans who were leading the team said that, oh, why don't we do this one, a story building? So they decided to make a square column. Then while they were going, then the other one said, ah, why don't we put the, the church pastor's residence on top? Then they decided to make it a circular encasement. So one particular building that they started as a single story, they didn't even, they didn't even, it, did, it didn't even occur to them to fortify the foundation before they continue. 
It was the same foundation that they started as a single story that was changed into a square structure, square, square column. And then it was encased again to a circular column. So it wasn't surprising that when they got to the top, the whole building came down. Unfortunately, all those artisans who were leading them got died. They were killed by the collapse of the structure. And unfortunately, 20 people, one person got missing today. This report is on the net. You can Google it. And I will, I will, I will, I will ask that each and every one should look for this report and read them. So when you read, you will be able to know exactly what is causing collapse of buildings. And that will advise you as to what, how to go about some of these things. And when you go to the assemblies, they have engineers that check some of these things. When you are putting up a building and you want to change it into a single story or maybe a story building, they will quickly look at the base. They will look at the structural stability and then they can give you permission to continue. And once you go to them, it means that they've given you approval. It means that all these things are considered. Yes, so when you look at national building regulation, LI 1630, it also says that every plot of land, you are not supposed to build more than two thirds of the land. At least one third of the land must be left and built. Meaning that if you have a plot of land where you can put up your building, it can only be within some specific section. The remaining sections must be left and built. So when you go there, they will check some of these things. The reason is that for when you are on your piece of land, you are supposed to enjoy fresh air. When you overbuild, it doesn't allow free flow of air. So for aeration purposes, they check some of this. In fact, they are all in the regulation. And so once they are asking you to do this, they are making sure that all these legal requirements are complied with. Can we go to the next slide? Yes, so when you put up a burden to avoid enforcement action by the authorities, the, the law, the law uses a special planning regulation. No, I think the act itself provides that when you put up a house or a building on a public space, the public space is like the road reservation, like lorry park, like markets, recreational area, football field, or a place, a place that is earmarked for such purposes. It can be sanitary area, uh, uh, swampy area, cemetery, all that. The assembly has the right to demolish it. In fact, the subsection two of that particular section requires that when the assembly is coming to demolish it, they should inform you, the owner. Now, after the demolition, after it has been demolished, they are supposed to surcharge you and recoup the cost of the demolition. The machine they use to do the, do the demolition, the fuel they use, the workman they use, the force that they use, they are supposed to calculate all and take the money from you. So you can see there, this is one of the sites and they were demolishing it seriously. And uh, looking at the back, you can see a policeman standing there with a gun, protecting them. In some assemblies, they go with soldiers. And so when you see your building being demolished, three-story building, you can finish it within a twinkle of an eye and paint it nicely and begin to sleep in, inside. When the time comes for it to be demolished, and you are not able to prove to them that you have been permitted to do that, they will demolish it like this with soldiers, and there is nothing you can do. You can only see your burden being brought down and lament. To avoid this, it is advisable you see the development authorities so that you are protected. The next slide. Yes, so now, these days, 
When you go to the assembly, there are some documents we check before we give you permission to put up your building. Section 47, yes, of the L L Lands Act. Section 47 of Lands Act, Act 1036, provides that when you have a piece of land that is in your name and you have a spouse, you have a, a wife, right? Or you, the wife, you have a husband. Automatically, your wife or your husband becomes part owner of the land. You cannot sell that land without a written permission from your wife. So if you don't know from today, if you have a piece of land now, that is in your name. When your marriage had been performed at the time, or after marriage performance, it can even be customary marriage, right? Once the customer marriage is done and you perform, you go and purchase a land, that land automatically becomes yours and that of your wife. So if you bring permission for me, you bring application to me for me to give you permission to put up your building. I expect that the name of your, your, your permit should be in the name of you and your wife. If uh, if you bring, you bring application to me as engineer, and then you are not able to say, I bought it from Mr. K, and the wife has given permission for him to sell it to me, it means that you are violating the law. I hope it's clear. And the law also requires that you must prove with evidence that th that land belongs to you. So for instance, there is this mistake that we usually do. I am called engineer Davo Salom Wanda, but mostly I register my documents uh, in the name of engineer Davo Wanda. Now, assuming that I have another document, I went to purchase the land and the land is registered in the name of engineer Davo S. Wanda. Now I am applying for permit and the permit is supposed to be in the name of engineer Wanda. Engineer Wanda is not the same as Engineer S. Wanda. Is it the same? Yes. So I would demand that either you go and change the name or you must bring an affidavit to indicate that the name Engineer Davo Wanda is the same as Engineer Davo S. Wanda before I continue with the process. So once you pass through all these processes, and then permission is given to you, there wouldn't be any litigation in the future. So let's go to the next slide. Yes, so gradually I am bringing my presentation to an end. As a professional, the best thing you can do for your client is to advise them professionally. Sometimes we are tempted to impress our clients Okay, I remember there was one artisan who advised a client that, oh, you have a piece of land. This land is very good enough. So why don't you shift the building to the back so that you have vast space at the front? The client was happy. Oh, now this guy is very good. He has advised me nicely. So quickly what they did was to shift the building to the back. Meanwhile, the other person sharing a common boundary with him has packed blocks on his property. That blocks that are packed on the property, they are not packed on the boundary. They are packed on the property. But then this guy thought that the way the block is packed, the blocks are packed linearly. They are packed on the boundary. So he shifted the building and it entered into the plot. But when the guy got to know that this building is being built on this plot, he drew his attention and asked that he should demolish the building. Fortunately or unfortunately, the one who is putting up the building is a church member. So he called me, the engineer, this is what is happening. And that the man said he will come to the assembly, so the assembly will come and demolish it. And that I should demolish it before he gets the assembly. So I came to the site and I said, ah, so 
why you know me you have my number we are in the same church we meet every sunday or every saturday and we, wednesdays why don't you call me to advise you before you put up this it is so the it was the artisan the basin who asked me that let me shift it so that i can have space in front so in that case if you are the professional in this case professional craftsman what will you do? Or well, what will you tell that professional? What will you do? Will you be happy with that professional? He has advised you, and you think that he's advised you properly, but at the end, he is going to make you incur so much cost. He had to demolish it. For me, even though you are you are you are you are my church member. There is nothing I can do. So what I told him was that either you have agreement with the person, so you buy part of his land and add it up to yours. So that when he is developing, when he is developing his land, he will not, you know, uh, bring the development close to your property. Or you demolish it. You have to go with the latter. He the burden that he is constructed almost up to length of the had to come down. So let us advise professionally. We can see that from all the slides that we talked about, the advantages and disadvantages. I think the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. Am I right? The advantages of seeing the development authority, they outweigh the disadvantages. And therefore, it will be prudent for us to see to the development authorities before we put up. I mean, some of these things, I think that assembly should even take it upon themselves to do education, but most of them, they don't do it because they have a lot to do. Currently, some of them are even on strike. They have a lot to do, so they don't even have time to come and educate us. We thank Professor Hans Frey for bringing us here. In fact, you people are very lucky because he is not only with IET, he has gone a bit further and is with the Engineering Council, the council that lances the professionals in the country. And he is in one of the committees, very strong committee. So once he is with you, it means that when it comes to certification of documents uh, in, in terms of engineering practice, is here. Yes. So thank you very much. I would like to bring my presentation to an end. God bless you. Thank you so much. Engineer Wanda, for the wonderful presentation. There is no wonder that your presentation was wonderful. Yes, um, Engineer Wanda gave us uh, a brief presentation on why to register and obtain permission before putting up a building. And I think many of us have learned a lot today. I'm sure many of us are putting up our buildings and we fall into that category. And this education will help us to go back and do the right thing because it's obvious. And I'm sure I'm one of them. Building without permits. Earlier, the president of the Northern sector gave us um, a presentation on how to become an engineer, the registration process and the category of engineers. I will now open the floor for clarifications if you have questions for the two presenters. I'm aware some of you here are already members of the engineering um, body, IET. There are questions for our a presenters, we can take a few questions. Yes. Yes, please. 
first is that uh, let's say in a standardized format of putting up the government, we have the architect or we have the clerk of what you supposed to be the architect facility on site. So you are now the clients will come to the architect, I want a building this this education and you do the exact. They may send it to the district office or wherever and they will endorse it for them. And they will give it to uh, any mason to do the building. And when they go on site, now there is no there is no architect, the architect representative on the site. They go and do something else which doesn't correspond with what is on the paper or the drawings. And now at the uh, later something happens, see the building collapses. When such happens, who will be responsible? Who will be held responsible? The second question is, uh, as, as a student, a uh, construction technology student, and also someone who designs uh, drawings, say an architect, or a speaker to say a that person, by the time I will, which of the four categories can I fall under if I have registered to the part? So that is the P, 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 T, and the P, uh, Thank you. Uh, two other questions. Do I read them or you want to? Okay. There are questions. Um, we have some of your colleagues who have joined online, and there are some two questions. I'll just read those questions and you can pick them together. But the first question is why are there a lot of illegal structures and you do not demolish? That is one. Second question is please. If the foundation for a two story building is strong enough to carry three story load, why should the authority stop a developer? from adding a floor to an original two-story for which permit was required. Next, the question is, I take it again, please. If the foundation for a two-story building is strong enough to carry three-story load, why should authorities stop a developer from adding a floor to an original two-story for which permit was acquired? Permit was acquired for two-story. Okay, the last question is, my question is engineer, Engineer said at every stage during the execution of the building, they have to come and expect it. I want to know, I want to, okay, to know, okay, right. I, let me, I want to know I need to pay money for the inspection. Okay, I want to know whether I need to pay money for the inspection. Right, so these are the questions. All right, all right, thank you very much. I think that, let me start with the first one. Okay, let me start with the, the last one, okay. The whether there is the need to pay for the inspection. Uh, the stages are spelled out. Mostly what happens is that when you apply to the assembly, all these things must be calculated and incorporated into the first permit. And so when these officers are going to your site, they are fooled by the assembly to inspect. You are not supposed to pay them. Once you pay your permit, that is, that is all. But for, of course, when they come to site, they will advise you. There are certain things that they are not supposed to, you are not, you are not, they are not supposed to be doing, but they will do it to help you. In that case, if you yourself, you give them something, fine, but you are not obliged to pay them. They have been paid already to do that. And so the law says that when you are going to start, you should notify the assembly the various days that various stages will be done. Once you notify them, they will come. But if you fail to notify them, it means that you are committing an illegality. The second one also talks about uh, you have a foundation for two story, but you want to put up additional story and the assembly is stopping you from doing it. Yes. 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 So when you have, when you design a foundation, for three story, but you 
you originally put up a two story, but this time you want to make it three story, just like you designed the foundation. You need to prove to the assembly that yes, the foundation down there can carry a three story. So we have this structural calculation, structural integrity report must be produced to the assembly. So you can't just wake up and then you begin to put additional story on it without proving to the assembly that yes, the, the foundation has been designed for three story. In fact, when you present your drawing to the assembly in the first instance, they will only look at the, the ability of the foundation to carry two story. They won't check for the three story because that is not what you're going to put up. Now, if it is time for you to put up the third story, which you have originally designed the foundation for, you must prove to the assembly again that originally I designed the foundation to carry three story, and therefore I want to put the third one on it. They will again check, they will again check to add all the various loads to see whether that foundation is it's, it's good enough to sustain that and safely transmit the load to the subsoil. And so there is this report that we call structural integrity. It must be produced this time to prove to the assembly that yes, that can be done. Once that is done, you are good to go. Then the next one talks about why we have several illegal, illegal buildings and we are not <laughs> demolishing them. <laughs> you see, when you are not caught by the law, you can go scot-free. The assembly, unfortunately, are not resource enough to go around every day and be demolishing on a daily basis. If we have that resources, the personal resource, personnel, human resources, and then the, the logistics, equipment, and all that, they will be doing that. But when there is a need, like a particular area, there is attention there, quickly they will find out whether you have been given permission. If you look at the recent Pokwa um, uh, interchange, before it was constructed, we had a lot of structures, especially at the right hand side, one coming from Accra, story buildings and all that. Most of them were illegally constructed. At the time, the assembly wasn't ready enough to demolish them. But when it was time for the interchange to be constructed, they approached them. They were even supposed to pay the assembly for demolishing those structures for them. So when the law, you know, when the law hasn't come to your doorstep, fine. But the fact is that these illegal structures there is one that is cited at public space. I explain public space. One, once you are in public space, the law says at any time, the assembly can demolish it. Like I said, it involves money. When you, take, when you hire a grader or maybe a dozer a day to go and demolish a structure, the hiring cost at my place currently is 3,000 Ghana cities. And then I'm supposed to pay the operator 200 Ghana cities. I'm supposed to fuel it 1,500 Ghana cities. So if I do all this, put all of this, uh, the, there must be a guide who will be guiding the operator. And I go and pay rationing for the security officers to come and guide me to demolish your structure for you. After that, it shouldn't be my cost. I shouldn't bear that cost alone. You are supposed to pay me. So I'll go to court and say, Mr. K, has put up this structure at a public space and therefore the court should let you pay that money to me. I think that is all, or the last one. That's all, right. Yes, um, you, you agree with me that we are learning a lot. This is only one of the CPD, continuous professional development training uh, available for members of the Institute. And so if you want to learn more and to practice well in your profession, you will need to join. We have uh, some forms here that uh, as graduates, you are already qualified to be. I know he didn't answer one of the questions because I'm coming to that. Yeah, he didn't answer the question of membership. Someone asked, I was going to. 
Uh, in terms of the membership, as you rightly said, from uh, is it architects, you said architects, first degree or second degree. You know, the moment you complete the first degree, you qualify to be a professional engineer based on the courses that you have already done. It is not only that you did, you had other courses that you have gone through to that point, but that one can be classified as professional engineer. Yeah. To add to that, what um, I think HND is professional engineering technologist. First degree, it's professional engineer. In the area you specialize, professional engineer, civil engineering, professional engineer, electrical engineering, like that. Now, I think there is one question about architects and the uh, uh, draftsman. Uh, the design, yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Literally, but somebody is online. He might, he might want to ask a question online. He might, you, you can pick up. Yeah. Um, yeah, yes, I was. Yeah, yes. thank you very much. Uh, uh, please, I want to ask, there's this notion outside there that when you build your house to a certain level, they can demolish it. So you see people building and there's a, a, a notion also that a permits doesn't, uh, uh, when they come and write, stop work, produce permits, it doesn't destroy their building. So uh, they, you see people building without permits. Please, is, is it true that when you go to a certain level, nobody can demolish it? Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. My question will be answered. There is a question here too. Someone is saying that, assuming I'm a draftsman, I don't have my own stamp, and I'm done with someone's drawing, and I want a stamp on it. Please, aside architect, who again can put a stamp on the drawing for me. Okay, so any other, then he answered those questions. Wow, I'm having many hands. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I give yes, yes. Why is it that the best time to make check the strength of the structure? That makes it checking. The surface the of the or the Okay, so I think I will allow him to respond to these sort of questions and then we can take additional questions. Thank you very much. I think let me start with the last one. I said earlier that the engineering council, or I don't know whether I mentioned it here, that the main purpose is to regulate engineering practice. In order that we avoid unnecessary risk, deaths, and all that. So for us, if you put up or if you design a building, the interface is a bit rough. The architectural or the aesthetic aspect of it is not the best. And you bring it to us. That will not uh, worry as much. But what will worry us if, if that building should get collapsed? Uh, I, I, I was saying that a doctor, when a, med a medical practitioner should prescribe a wrong medication, it is either one person who is going to die, at most two or three, should a person be pregnant with uh, maybe twins or something. But if an engineer should commit a mistake in designing, or allowing a structure to be designed that is faulty and it should collapse. You have a lot of people being, being victims. Like I said, Batebi, for instance, at one collapse, 
we have two, uh, 20 people dying and one person is missing up to today. So that is why the aesthetic aspect of it, the surfacing and all that. In fact, the law permits assemblies to check all this, but their concentration is the structural stability of it in order that somebody will not lose his life. Then the, the, the other question about, um, you apply for permits. It has not been given to you, but you went ahead and developed. Uh, there are two things. You can apply for regularization. But the fact is that Section 8 of the LI 1630 National Building Regulation provides that when permission, uh, may, when application is presented to the assembly, assembly is supposed to process this and notify you as to whether the permit has been approved or not within three, three months. But if that is not done, under normal circumstances, Regulation 10 provides that, I said it, that you are supposed to be notifying the assembly about various stages. The law says after three months, you have the right to develop. So in order to meet Regulation 10, what you should do is that you attach a certificate or a receipt of submission proving that you submitted this application for more than three months. And that you are notifying them on these days that you are going to develop. Legally, it means you are covered. But you see, Prof. Hansfried may mention of a certain scenario where you go ahead and develop all rights. And then finally, later, assembly comes to say that, okay, your structure is 40. The way it is, there is heavy load here. In the future, it will collapse. What will you do? You have finished putting up your structure already. So uh, in some cases, what you have to do is to follow up, is to do a follow-up. In fact, I wrote a lot of articles about some of these things. People sometimes don't get permits just because of something small. Like I said, the name of applicant is K Mensa, but the title of the land is Mensa Kweku or Kweku Mensa. They are different. So you don't know whether you should register, you should approve the permit in the name of K Mensa, or you should approve the permit in the name of Kweku Mensa. So if you see the go back to the assembly to follow up, they will tell you that this is the problem with your, with your application. And what you can do to solve that is to obtain uh, affidavit or something, or reapply, and quickly you have your application. Sometimes something small. I have several applications on my table. Sometimes what they also do, which is a mistake, is that they prepare the drawing, everything all right, and they put the drug man's telephone number on it. You call the drug man and say, oh, I'm an architect. I don't even remember preparing a drawing for this man because Maybe he has done it for many months ago. And you can't get the applicant. His telephone number is not there. Sometimes the telephone number will be there, all right? You call, it will not go through. What do you do? You only have to keep it and pray that the applicant will follow one day. Until then, it will still be there. For all you know, your permit has been approved. Even come and collect it. You may not. There are a lot of permits that have been approved, and they are lying in my office right now. They don't follow, they don't care. Well, some of the ones you submit the document, they just start developing. And once they finish with the building and they are in it, they think that everything is okay. For all you know, one day there will be something that you need to produce that document and you can't find it. So that is it. Um, and then the, the next one. People think that when they construct the building up to a certain level, it cannot be demolished. Please. This notion must be cleared. I think those on the line, yes. This notion must be cleared. I remember somewhere, uh, was it before 2000? Ronnie's uh, former president of blessed memory went to demolish a story building around airport, 19 something thereabouts. Alaji Drisu, very good. Isuf, very good. The law says that 
Once you do not have permits to put up the building, you are at risk of being demolished. The building is at risk of being demolished. They can demolish it at any, they can demolish it today. They can wait when you finish building it and they come and demolish it. So why don't you have the permit to protect? For me, I'm an engineer. Even in the district where I am an engineer, when I was about putting up a building, just a single story, I made sure I applied and I made sure my colleagues sat on the committees, approve of it before I started the foundation because I know the implications. If I start building now, currently as engineer in my district, nobody will go there to say demolish because they know the one who is in charge of all this is the district engineer. But I know the implication. I could be transferred one day. Even if I finish and I'm no more there, somebody will come one day and ask for it and they can demolish it for you. The law says when such a thing happens, you are supposed to even be charged, you know, for, 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 for demolition. I'm using machine to demolish it. I'm supposed to pay you for that. So please, even the number of buildings that I demolished, most of them, they've been completed. Though. They've been completed. Just that uh, some of them, they even packed some of the things inside, but they were not living in them. But once there is a need to demolish it, you demolish it. There is nothing you can do. Some of the demolition team, they come with soldiers, with ammunition. If you try, they will gun you down. You only watch your building that you have sweated with hard money to build to go down like that. You only cry. I think finally there was a question about somebody designed a building and then a, a, a drugs man drew it They when the building collapsed. Who should be blamed? Should we blame the architect? Should we blame the, the drug man? Should we blame the one who constructed it? Every building, they can be, they can put a team together to investigate the collapse. They will start from the design. Was there any design mistake? Then they come to the construction. Was there any problem with the construction? They will surely find out, just like by the report. Yes. Yes. So which professional stamped the building? When it, it happens that it is a fault of the designer, the architect, or maybe the draftsman, once it is certified by a professional, he will be very responsible. Because before you stamp, it means that you are checking to say that, yes, this building, I have checked the design, and structurally it is stable. And for, to the best of my knowledge, there is no problem with the one you put up this building, it will stand. Then when you check and it is not the fault of the designer, then you come to the structure itself. The building, even the concrete can be taken to lab for examination. We know the, the, the strength of the concrete. Then if the concrete is not good, who, who should be blamed? Is it the designer? The one who constructed it. So, when they put up a team together to investigate some of it, clearly whoever is at fault will be brought to book. And then they talk about, um, is it who else can put a stamp? Even this morning, I saw on our platform that the IET we've come out with guidelines uh, governing how to certify a document. Once you stamp a building or a building document or any structure, it means that you have certified it and you have aligned yourself to that document and that you'll be held responsible should there be any problem. It can be designed, it can be drawn by uh, a learning draftsman, somebody who doesn't know about draftsmanship. But once they bring it to me, I examine it, and I stamp it. It means that I have taken it to be my baby. If there is any problem, he will not be held responsible. I will be held responsible. That is why anytime they bring documents to me to certify, I look at it carefully to ensure that structurally it is stable. 
that whatever they have done, the minimum standards are met before I put my stamp on it. Once I put my stamp on it, the responsibility is not shifted from the one who designed it to me. So that is how it is. Thank you. Uh, in fact, in terms of the completion of structures for occupancy, there is the need for one to acquire uh, uh, occupancy certificate before you can, habitation certificate before you can occupy it. After completion, as you have completed, you have started your process from uh, acquiring the permit through the construction stage and all that. There is a need for you to acquire certificate of habitation before you can inhabit it. Because the engineers, the environmentalists need to come around to check whether there will be free flow of air within the house so that uh, our health will not be in any trouble. So after completion, certificate of habitation is also given to the landlords before they inhabit it. Thank you very much. And to add to the question of uh, who will stamp it, uh, when the architect designs it, and it's not a professional uh, architect, if it's a professional, uh, he will have a stamp. And the uh, processes that you need to go through to obtain a stamp, as an uh, engineer that was said, uh, we go through a lot of processes to certify that you are at that level that can assess uh, any plans or any design to stamp. So for the normal building, one story that does not have any structural component per se, any decision with architectural stamp or building technologies with stamp can stamp it. But the moment it moves to the structural level, story buildings, in the drawing, you don't have only the architecture drawing. You also need to have structural uh, analysis uh, plans. So you have the architecture one that can be stamped by any architect, but the structural one should be stamped by a structural engineer. And as uh, engineer that was said, please, it's not easy when you get, you don't just take somebody's plan and say you have stamped. All the responsibility comes to you, the person, the professional who has stamped. And uh, you need to assess the designs very well and ensure that it has met all the technical parameters before you append your stamp or your signature on it, because all the responsibility will fall on you. Uh, for now, if you become an engineer, you cannot just obtain stamp. You need to practice for some times, go through some professional development and those things for us to assess to be sure that you are at that level before you are granted stamp. When I started as an engineer, I wasn't given a stamp. It took me some time. I have to grow into the engineering profession for some years or some time before when I applied for stamp, I was granted. So that is, that is the, uh, the case. Someone also asked even on the online as well. So issue with the stamp. All right, okay. So I take two more questions and the final set of questions. We've been here since morning, but I think I will acknowledge the presence of our mother. He's a member of IET, engineer Mata Danso. In fact, our mother, she taught me in 1997. When I was a student here, Mata Danso taught me when I was in first year in 1997. So that's why I call him my mother. I think he is old enough to be my mother actually. But he's still with us. And she's still beautiful. Can't you see? <laughs> yes, I take two questions here. Let me read these questions online. Then I take questions from the floor. Um, here we have, please. And of course, we have um, engineer Dori Timenu, another lady, a colleague. She was, she happened to be my mate, and so we're all taught by my mother Daso. Now, please, will the development authority accept endorsement from all the IET Ghana P professional engineers categories on a story building when applying for building permits? He said all categories, but that question, okay. All categories, please. Then the second question, please, after applying for a permit, Something authorities notice some anomalies 
Why can't the assembly be prudent enough or proactive to respond for clarity on the anomalies? Okay. The third one, please, I am a certified, I am certified as a construction engineer for I have been trained to design structures up to four-story structure. Can I approve or certify a three-story building of mine? Yeah. Okay, right. So then I take some questions from the floor. Let me give my chance to, yes, yes, uh, Mr. Oso Acha, yes. Okay. There's a, a, a approved building permit, which the land means, let's say, 80 feet length of the, of the site. The plot is 80 feet. But when the surveyor was demarcating the land, he gained some 10 or 20 feet extra. So in this case, if I'm developing, the, the, the permit will read 80, but the site is, is let's say 100. Can I bid use the pillars for, for the 100? I will be I get to my point. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Newton. Uh, please, uh, by theory, all know before you can get a building uh, permit, you need a site plan. So I want to develop on a piece of land. By the area I find myself, the area is not planned. And I want to get a site plan. In such situation, how, how do I find myself to get a site plan before I can get a building permit? Uh, if there's any other question, we'll take the last question and then we please give it to them. And that will be the end. And then we can close. Yes, my name is Samar Amapo. I'm for construction technology. My question is on land acquisition and development. Please, can a piece of land that has been put to be used as a residential building to be turned into a public building? Thank you. Okay, so let's give the last question. Bandi Abraham is my name. My question is, uh, what is the two institutions doing about the roadside craftsmen? I think most of these dangers that are occurring in the construction sector, majority are coming from them. So what regulations is these two institutions putting on, I mean, to regulate those people or build their capacity? To yeah, there was there's a hand up, and that should be the very last one. Yeah. The same as what he said. And one question too is, is a, is a school campus or university campus, part of a public space. Thank you. I think that, let me answer that one first. Um, I want to quote from the law straight so that I don't make any mistake. Uh, when you look at the law, it defines public space. Public, public space, this is um, Land Use and Spatial Planning Act, Act 925, 2016. You know, public space as you know it may be defined differently. So for this law, we have a section that is called interpretation. It's, it defines or interprets each and every law or every, every word that is used inside. So public space, it means, this is how it is, I quote, public space means generally open area accessible to and used by the public, including resource lands, urban utility space, riparian, riparian buffer zones, natural parks area, forests, urban parks, recreational area, and infrastructure right of way, area of culture or historic interests. 
all these are public spaces. So the university, once it is being patronized by the public, it's public space. And when you come to another definition, in some regulations, they call it community rights of space. The community right of space is also defined here. That the community right of space include road, streets, footpath, right of view, or right of way, school ground. So the school is here. School ground, hospital ground, open space, cemetery, playing field, square, Deba ground, market place, public place of assembly, or any space or ground or, or area of public or community use that exists or is to, is to be designated in an approved nature or local plan or under a provision of any law. So if we have a plan, a local plan, that is earmarked, a portion of the local plan, that is earmarked to be public space automatically, or community right of space automatically becomes public, public space. Now, going on the remaining questions. That is the last one. So let me go to the second one from the bottom to the top. Why not regulate this uh, craftsman, the roadside class craftsman? The roadside class craftsman Initially, we had no uh, issue about regulating engineering practice in the country. Previously, it was limited to professional engineer, those with first degree and above. But now with the engineering council, there is provision for even the craftsmen to be regulated. So if you, if you remember, in Engineer Kello's presentation, he indicated that we have PE, professional engineer, professional engineering technologist, professional technician, and then professional craftsman. They are all supposed to be regulated. The law says, in fact, it has given the freedom for them to come and join. But if you don't join and there is a problem, they will ask you, do you have lances to practice as a mason? If you don't have lances to practice as a mason and there is a problem, you will face it squarely. You see, all that we do, if the law doesn't catch you, you can walk free. But when the law catches you, that is where you see where the problem lies. So um, now gradually, I think we are coming there. Some of them walk to our office and they want to register. And once you register with us, they will, will train you. We'll have this CPD that Professor Hans Fred talked about and we'll regulate all that you do. And your mind will be open to some of these things. So you don't go across that blunder. That uh, mason caused my, my, my church member. Correction or uh, conversion of land. Um, when you have a piece of land that is designed for residential purposes, you put up your residential building. And now you want to convert it to commercial uh, property. The law says apply to the assembly. Once there are certain things they'll go through. Once they've given you approval to convert it, you can do that. But if the commercial property, in fact, the, the, the particular conversion you want to do, if it will not have adverse effects on the people around you, they will permit you. But if it will, they will advise you appropriately. Now, um, the next one, it's about you have a piece of land that is located that place is not planned uh, okay that, that one is also different yes yes very good in, in planning, uh, before we give approval or we give permits to you, like Riley said, you need to submit a site plan. 
So the site plan, it's usually extracted from the scheme of the area. When you look at the map of the area, they are divided into plots. So each plot is numbered. So my plot is plot number six. If I go to the assembly, I go with the site plan showing that my plot is plot number six before I apply. But in your area, the place doesn't have a scheme. It is not planned, but you want to put up a building. What you do is to have a surveyor to prepare what we call cadastral survey. Cadastral survey. I said in the morning that, you see, those days we were taught geography to mean uh, the planning of space, land, and we have features. We talked about latitude and longitude. We have latitude zero degrees passing through Tema. When you go to a corner of your plot, you can use GPS or uh, an app on your phone. It will tell you the coordinates over there. It will tell you the longitude over there and the latitude over there. Automatically, that place is fixed perpetually. When you go to the other corner, you can pick that one too. And then you can use that to prepare a site plan that we call cadastral survey map or the cadastral survey site plan. Then with that site plan, we will approve the permit for you. You don't need to have a scheme or a plan area before you apply. Once you have the cadastral survey site plan, they will approve the permit for you. And then, yes. The one important thing is that when you prepare that cadastral survey, the law says it must be certified by a licensed surveyor. It, it could happen that I don't have a license and I want to, and I know how to do it. I'll prepare it and present it to the assembly. Once it is not signed by a certified surveyor, it will not be approved. So what I do is that when I finish drawing, I'll give it to a certified surveyor who will sign and add his number of registration to it, and then it will be brought to the assembly for approval. And then uh, the next one is about, uh, you have a piece of land. On the site plan, it is 100 by say 90. But when you go to the site, it is 100 by 100. This happens a lot. The reason is that, and sometimes most of the cases, you go to the site, instead of 100 by 100, it is reduced to 100 by 80. It happens so much. And it is all because of the part surveyors we have in the system. And gradually, we are now moving to uh, a new survey system where you cannot misbehave, excuse me to say. When you pick a site plan, the site plan is the document you are going to show to a court or anybody in charge. Our advice that you go by the site plan. The document that is giving you authority to work over there is the site plan. Assuming the surveyor tells you that, okay, fine, you can shift because this place is all for you and you finish putting up your building to cover the whole stretch. And then in the future, somebody says, ah, my, my plot stretches from this end to this end. But when I measured, actually it's supposed to enter into yours. But you have built up to this end. And it is the case to court. The court will tell you to produce your document. That for the court, when we go to court, there is a point or a portion, yeah, there's a point that you come to the site. We call it locus. You visit site, you take the situations on the ground. When you get to the site, the court will find out that what you have as a document giving you authority to build is totally different from what you have done on the ground. There is a the court will rule in your favor. And as I said, most of these things are done by Sometimes some of the surveyors, they want to impress you. Oh, I for my clients, and some of them, they even go to extend or okay, give me some money, let me add this portion to you. If you do it, you do it at your own disadvantage. 
And one other thing is that the site plan that is prepared for you, it is prepared out of a scheme. We normally have a scheme covering or a layout, what we now call local plan, covering the whole area. And plot number six, which, you, which is allocated to you, is also shown over there on that scheme. So if you want to extract your site plan, it will be extracted from that one, the local scheme. So you can even go and change this. The one that assembly has covering the whole area is still there. So if you go and put up a building that is contrary to the one you have, it means automatically it's contrary to what they have at the Development Authority office. I remember one time I was in court and I was to bring a local plan. We had to call the local plan officer to bring it to the court. When the other party saw it, I was, I was, uh, I was called as a professional to come and give advice on two people who were litigating among each other. I made reference, I prepared my reports. I picked the person, the first person, the, what, what we call the, the, the plaintiff, the plaintiff applicant, the, the site plan. And I picked the defendant's site plan. And then I made reference to the local plan of the area. When the defender realized that my report is not favoring him, he said, no, what I prepared is contrary to what is in the office. So they called the town planning officer, now, uh, the one we now call physical planning officer. He brought the scheme there. And lo and behold, what I prepared, it's the same as what is in the office. So this case was ruled against the defender. The defender was trying to use another access to his plot. And that is how it ended. So I will always advise that the, 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 the site plan must be complied with. That is the document that is giving you power to put up your building. Thank you. Okay. I beg you, you can take your document, send it to the district assembly within your boundary. You go to a fiscal planning officer, ask him to produce the local plan and give you the actual dimension on the local plan to determine your ground measurement. Yes, sorry. Sometimes the roads, the road, each and every road has a length. Sometimes it is about 100 feet, sometimes it's about 60 feet, sometimes it's about 40 feet. It could happen that the one who is showing it to you says that road is 100 feet. But on the ground, it's supposed to be uh, uh, maybe 80 feet. So, but even if you look at it, the road, you can scale it. The surveyor can tell you that, oh, the road is not to this end. But what they forget is this. I talked about it earlier, that every road has two sections. We have the carriage and we have reservation. It may mean that the carriage is the one that you are seeing. The reservation goes beyond what you have. As so if you put up, it may mean that you are putting the burden inside the reservation. You can only get that from the office. So you either go, like my colleague said, to the office to find out, or you comply with what you have. Thank you. Right, so finally, we'll take one last question um, from the chat. In fact, I have a similar problem with what uh, Mr. Wusulacha was talking about. But you see, what I did, I maintained my, my, what is on my land because I confirmed from the Chima district office. What happened was that the person next to my plot, he actually went about two feet to the road. He went two feet. And when I when he told somebody, whether the person was a uh, severe or whatever, to come to me to convince me, because I was putting up a wall, to convince me to also extend my to, to conform to uh, to his, but I had applied for permit, and so when I went there, they've done redemarcation. 
And so the, the extra, if the product number has been changed, so they change the product number and everything. So I have the actual dimension on my uh, this thing, match what is in the assembly. So I didn't conform, I didn't, I didn't build to what they have done. I maintain my line. I didn't move to the road, I didn't change. So you may have to actually confirm from the assembly and don't change. Yeah, anyway, so let me read the, the, the last question. When you travel outside, especially Europe, they design and construct their roads to allow for pedestrians, traffic, bicycles, scooters, and motorcycles ways. What are the plans of our district assemblies and engineers towards a future as such for our roads, please? Yes. Now, thank you. Uh, there was one question that uh, one of the members asked whether, as to what the institution of engineering and other uh, Ghana institution of engineering also doing that the two but the institution of engineering and technology. Uh, in terms of people who are building anyhow and are constructing anyhow, it is not responsibility of the two engineering bodies to uh, maybe crack the whip. Now we have engineer, engineering council. They have the responsibility to do that. And they are more or less, let's say, not the Ministry of Western and Housing. Uh, they should strengthen the district assemblies to ensure that some of these policies and uh, laws are followed. The engineering, uh, the institutions are there to regulate the professionalism of the people practicing. But if other people are doing certain things, is the, the state that has responsibility to uh, take up that responsibility to whip. And again, with this uh, uh, problem with land crossing here and there, it's mostly the problem coming from people we call surveyors. When you go to there, say they have some surveyors and they are not following the laws. So if your yeah, the plot of your land is, uh, let's say, 80 by 80, they will just connive and make some decision and give you 100 by 80. At the end, you realize that part of your project will have entered into another person's uh, uh, land. And normally it happens, normally it does from uh, new developed or developing areas. So those who go there first, they start developing. And they, let me say, they, 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 they steal some part of other people's land. So before the other people also come in, they realize that part or portion of their land is in the project of the person who settled there earlier. I think the uh, uh, local authorities should have the strength to demolish the buildings, especially those who extend into the streets. When there are some streets around, they extend their project into it and they, they should be demolished. Those buildings must be demolished so that it will serve as a deterrent to others not to continue doing that. The last question is asking that in Europe and other places, we have motorways, bikes, and those things. In Ghana here, uh, excuse me to say that uh, we have relaxed in our design, uh, especially in the urban areas. The city planning should cover all these things. Roads should have bicycle lanes, uh, pedestrian walking, and these things. But I don't know, I think it's because of costing, uh, putting up road and also extending for bicycle lane and pedestrian. So, uh, we relax those things, but it's a good example that uh, we all have to learn from it. I believe that one of you or the questioner on the on, on the system might be in a position to influence some of these things. I always tell my student that we are teaching you the right thing. You are there to go back into the community to work. When you go and you are placed in certain positions, make sure the right things are done. Sometimes when you are teaching or you are lecturing, the student will come back to you. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are we doing? We are there to lecture, to teach you. So you are supposed to go back and practice. We don't have any power in our hands. And as we are doing this seminar, we are educating ourselves. So the, the best thing is that we try to practice it when we find ourselves out there. Uh, because uh, of our time, I think we have done uh, good time or work uh, very well within our time. Time is over. Uh, I would like to personally thank uh, IET officials over here, uh, chairman, uh, chairman, uh, deputy chairman, secretary, other members. I would like to thank uh, our staff and students who are here. 
I'd like to thank members who are also online who have joined us. Uh, today we, have, we had two sessions and uh, I can say that uh, they've been handled very, very well. Important questions have been asked. Uh, befitting answers are, are, have been provided. Uh, this was not the end, that was just the beginning. Uh, in the morning, a lot of students expressed interest that we have this turn regularly organized. And I promise you, we're going to have it done regularly. Uh, today, when you look at the general legal framework and the membership rule that we, uh, we got ourselves into, uh, the speech from Engineer Devo you know, uh, emphasized on burden and permits and those. Uh, we will bring in later people with uh, uh, mechanical, electrical, and other background to also uh, share with us. Uh, we are grateful we've been able to attend this program. Uh, that the senior members, lecturers here, uh, junior members, uh, the students, they are junior members. Sometimes some came and we were talking, said we are also members of the community. Indeed, you are members, but you are junior members. <laughs> we are grateful for your time. Those who join us online, we are grateful for joining us. And as I told you at the beginning, uh, this is just the beginning of series of activities that we're going to have. Uh, we're even going to, at a point, going to have conference, well-organized conference, three days for people to come and share contribution to knowledge or research where they've done, and we'll just move on. So uh, we are grateful to all of you present, and we'll come to the end of this program. Uh, those of you who wants to ask for you, we've all uh, finished your, with your undergraduate, you are on your postgraduate masters. So you can become full members. You don't need to become student members. We have some forms here. You can come for them. Uh, you complete them, attach all the necessary uh, supporting documents, your certificate and others. And the fee uh, membership, uh, that was a, listen, how much is it? I forgot it. It's 500. Uh -huh. For the interview, because now to become a professional body, a member, it's not just something you walk in. It's just like uh, becoming a member of Medical Association of Ghana, becoming a doctor. You can't just say, I've, I've had my training, so I'm a member. No, you have to go and take examination, and you have to pass. Just like want, wanting to become a, a nurse. After your training in school, you have to go and take some uh, professional exam, examination to pass. Now, teaching too, we have started. The same with all professional bodies. So you complete the form, we have some here, uh, you add all the necessary documentation, complete it. Uh, then you add your money for examination. We are going to slate it. We have a date, and it will be done here. This one will let them. We will bring them here so that you have an entrance exams. There's an entrance exams and one-on-one -on -one interview. So you go through, then you become uh, a professional engineer after being a member. For a while, you can have your stamp. Uh, those of us who have stamps, sometimes we also earn something small from it. As people do their addition, they bring, we study it. If there are some errors, we made them to correct it. Then we stamp for them because they are, they are going to give to those people not free. Yeah. And uh, there was a question that I remember someone asked that if he can, he's also a professional, he can stamp his own. It's on, it's on, on ethical. No, you don't have to certify your own work if you allow someone to do it. So if you're even a professional, you have your, your, your stamp, in your, for your own design, you cannot or you should not uh, approve it. You should let another person do it for you so that there will be a second eye, second opinion to check what you have done and the person can stamp it for you. Uh, so uh, we... Uh, I will tell you, let me tell you, let me Yes, so if there's nothing, uh, maybe we'll allow for a short prayer to close uh, today's uh, uh, meeting. We are grateful. Please, you can send your feedback to us. When you finish uh, filling your form, uh, you, can, you can send it to uh, Felix. She's, uh, he's at the mechanical workshop, uh, auto work workshop. Felix, please uh, have uh, yeah, or you can also bring it to the various department. We'll collect them and put all of them together and we'll have a, a, a date for 
I don't think the exams is anything that is yours. Undergraduate uh, HND, they are all able to do it and pass. How come, Mr. Student? It shouldn't be a problem at all. Okay. So thank you. And shall we be outstanding for a short prayer? Uh, who will do that for us? Madam Mata, will you give us a short prayer? Our mother. <laughs> okay, thank you. Let's pray. Without you, this sermon. So we say thank you, Lord. As we move from here, we have not moved from the side. Continue to guide them to the Grant traveling messages to our visitors. Okay. And always give us the wisdom and energy to contribute our quota to the communities and the family. Thank you very much. Thank you for all of you. Yes, sir. Mr. Thank <laughs> you. 